Now I want to take a few um, questions. Yes, sir. Uh, Mufakam Ja, you have a question. Please go ahead. Uh, so, my question is uh, whenever we are considering a control value fixed in space, so we are deriving equations, we are getting conservation form of equations. Okay, and when the control value is moving with space, we are getting non conservation form of equations. So, I want to know the difference between the conservation form and non conservation form. Yes, so the, the question is uh, in these derivations, uh, in one manner when we are carrying out the derivation, we are obtaining what is called as a conservation form and in other manner we are obtaining what is called as a non-conservation form. So, let me first try to uh, go back and point out uh, what is meant by a conservation form. Uh, let me go back here. So, when we employed our mass balance equation for a control volume um, in the slide that is uh, projected on the screen, we obtained an inherently conservative form of the, of the equation. So, the, the form that is uh, now shown as equation 1 as partial derivative of rho with respect to time, uh, time plus the divergence of rho v equal to 0 is what we will call, we call a conservative form. So, the conservative form actually comes about automatically when you obtain the, the differential equation from a balance statement point of view or in other words uh, if you if you look at the other approach that we employed. Here also we started with an integral form which was essentially a balance statement if you recall on an integral basis and we have simply manipulated that balance statement into a balance statement on a per unit volume basis and therefore, you again obtain the form in the conservative form. So, whenever you are employing an Eulerian approach of deriving the expression, which will necessarily mean that you are doing a balance statement on a control volume type approach, you will necessarily get the equation in a conservative form. On the other hand, this last part which I described if you if you go go to slide number 6 on differential analysis what we are doing here is we are utilizing the inherent lagrangian form because we have decided that we will follow a one given particle and we will simply make sure that the mass content for this one fluid particle is going to remain unchanged which is what we write in terms of the substantial derivative of the mass content being zero so, my point is that if you employ a uh, Lagrangian approach of uh, deriving these equations, you will always get the equations in a non-conservative form which is shown out here. As far as fluid mechanics is concerned, it does not matter whether you are obtaining the equations in a non-conservative form or you are obtaining them in a conservative form here. Uh, on the other hand, when it comes to CFD utilization, especially for a finite volume technique as we will see in the later half of this course, uh, the conservative form is something that is found to be more useful. But the point and the answer that I want to give here is that if you employ Eulerian approach for derivations, you will obtain conservative form. If you employ Lagrangian way of doing things uh, in terms of derivations, you will obtain a non-conservative form. SVNIT uh, Surat, you have a question, please go ahead. Sir, so the way in which you explain the so solid body rotation and the shear uh, deformation during the coordinate workshop, sir, can you repeat the same thing? Yes. Can you repeat the same thing so that the participant can have a better understanding using the two perpendicular ball pins? Yes, I will do that in, in a second. Actually, I had tried to, uh, so the, the question is uh, related to the, the way the uh, rotation and the uh, shear strain rates were uh, described and uh, obtained. Um, what I had done actually was uh, let me let me project that slide and then also I will show what I what I mean by that. 
So, here uh, what I have projected right now is uh, really what I had shown with those uh, two pens uh, in, in the coordinator workshop. So, let me try to show that again uh, through the uh, through the video camera. So, if if you people are looking at uh, uh, looking at this, so what I have is the two perpendicular uh, segments. Uh, one is AB, which is the horizontal segment, and the, the one which is black here is the uh, vertical segment AC. When you are looking at it, now what I mean by the decomposition of this uh, rotational motion and the uh, shear deformation is that initially you can think about both of these guys experiencing a anti clockwise solid body like rotation in this fashion. So, both of them are getting turned by the same amount through an anti clockwise sense and then follow this by one segment experiencing anti clockwise shear rotation and the other segment experiencing a clockwise shear rotation. So, finally, what ends up happening is that the segments A B and A C will end up in a situation such as what I am holding these two pens. So, let me repeat this. I start with a, a mutually perpendicular situation, then both of these guys experience a uh, anti clockwise rotation of the same amount and then one segment keeps on going anti clockwise due to the shear deformation, the other segment keeps on going clockwise because of the uh, shear deformation. So, this is the final location for segments A, B and A, C as I had drawn it. Uh, hopefully, this is, uh, this is this is carrying the point across and this is what I had tried to actually show through the, the sketch that I have prepared here in, uh, in the slide number 22 on kinematics. Uh, Institute of Road and Transport uh, erode, you have a question? This is uh, Dr. Darvish Mohidin uh, from IRTT Remote Center, Tamil Nadu. I have one question uh, in connection with uh, various types of lines. While explaining uh, the kinematics of fluid flow, you, you, you have explained something about uh, uh, path lines, streamline and streak lines. Uh, I, I just I want to know what are the practical importance of these lines in your flow field and how they are helpful in CFD analysis. This is question number one. And I have one more question, question number two, you have explained about the Lagrangian method and the Eulerian approach to solve the flow field problems and uh, how to select uh, the particular type of solution method for a particular application and what are the limitations of each in uh, two methods. These are the two questions, thank you. Yes, so there are two questions, one is related to the different uh, lines that I talked about, the path line, streamline and streak line. Uh, in particular, how are they uh, used in practice as well as from a CFD point of view. Uh, I tried to explain that during the lecture that uh, uh, if you if you are performing an experiment for example, if you are actually performing a fluid dynamics experiment in a lab, many times what you will do is you will employ a flow visualization type technique and one of the very uh, popular flow visualization techniques perhaps slightly older is uh, creating hydrogen bubbles in, in a liquid flow in particular in water flow and then letting those hydrogen bubbles flow along with the, with the flow and then taking a video camera and then sh uh, and recording their motion. So, each of these hydrogen bubbles that are created in that particular technique are basically tracing a path line which gets recorded when a video recording of such a flow field is, uh, is carried out. So, that is one uh, practical application where people have employed these uh, ideas in, in a um, uh, lab setting. When it comes to CFD application, uh, what I said was that usually as a result of the CFD simulation, you will generate a velocity field uh, in the flow domain. So, the, what I mean by velocity field is that you will generate the velocity numbers at the various nodes or the computational points where you are calculating all these. So, using this velocity field, you can actually generate uh, the streamlines and in fact, most of the times the, the graphics uh, plotting softwares that nowadays people use 
will automatically generate the path lines and streamlines once you provide the velocity field as the input. So, that way you can uh, you can easily get the, the streamlines from your computational fluid dynamics uh, analysis. So, that is uh, that is what I would like to say on uh, question number 1. Yes, question number 2 was uh, about uh, Lagrangian versus uh, Eulerian point of view uh, and where they are utilized. So, typically if you see fluid flow analysis, pure fluid flow motions, you will always see that uh, an Eulerian uh, uh, point of view is employed. Uh, the reason is because uh, the Lagrangian point of view is very, very cumbersome to utilize. Where you will see a Lagrangian point of view uh, employed is uh, the kinds of situation that I was talking about la yesterday, uh, especially these rarefied gas dynamic situations, where the density is very, very low and correspondingly the number of gas molecules in the domain of interest are very low in which case you cannot really employ continuum methods and you actually have to go to uh, a Lagrangian uh, method where you actually select a large number of particles uh, which are your gas molecules and then track them as they move about in the domain to find out the flow field information. Uh, so, that is where you will see the, the utility of um, Lagrangian approach. Also in situations as were being pointed out yesterday in the discussion. Uh, there are some situations when we have solid particles embedded in fluid flows. So, to analyze uh, such uh, situations, people utilize Lagrangian approach to track the solid particles and the Eulerian uh, equations of motion for the solution of the fluid problem. So, that is another example where uh, Lagrangian is uh, mixed with Eulerian in, in some sense. Which method will be more accurate, whether it is uh, Eulerian or Lagrangian method for a particular application? Uh, the, the question is whether Lagrangian or Eulerian method will be more accurate in a given application. Uh, accuracy wise both are uh, probably the same, it is just that to obtain the same accuracy the amount of uh, computational time for example, in case of Lagrangian approach is very, very large unless you are dealing with uh, rarefied gas dynamics type situations. But accuracy wise, I do not see if any one is going to be more accurate than the other. It is just that practically speaking, uh, using uh, Lagrangian approach is essentially impossible for standard continuum flow situations. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. I got answers for both the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. MES Pillai Panvel, please go ahead if you have a question. My question is uh, uh, regarding slide number 20. Uh, acceleration of the fluid particle uh, where uh, the local rate of change plus convective part that is spatial uh, part has been described. Uh, whether this application is uh, uh, applicable, I mean true for other uh, conservation flow variables also. So, the, the question is about uh, what was worked out on slide number 20 which was the acceleration of uh, fluid particle. Uh, and the, the specifically the question is about the local rates and the convective rates and whether they are applicable to other flow variables also, if I understand the question correctly. And yes, uh, the local rate of change and the convective rate of change will in general be applicable for any flow variable. So, in this particular instance, when I worked out this problem, the flow variable was taken as the velocity and in particular the three velocity components were separately considered as u, v and w. But if you are desirable, you can always try to find out the substantial rate of change of pressure for example, in which case there will be a local rate of change of pressure and a convective rate of change of pressure. So, in which case wherever you see this u uh, inside the derivative, you will replace that uh, inside the derivative u with p as the, the value of or the quantity of interest. Similarly, you can obtain a substantial rate of change of temperature as well. So, there is no, no problem with that. Any flow variable can have a substantial rate of change and it will be always composed of the local rate of change and the convective rate of change. Now, in situations, special situations, it is possible that the local rate of change is 0. For example, if you are dealing with steady flow. It is possible that in some special situations, maybe the convective rate of change is 0. But in general, both of these are present 
and both of these are applicable for any flow variable. KJ Somaya Mumbai, you have a question, please go ahead. Hello sir, I have one question. In kinematics 18 slide, hello, uh, kinematics 18 slide, you have written that uh, second step, uh, 1 upon uh, elemental volume times substantial derivative of elemental volume is equal to del u by del x plus del v by del y. How the left hand side has arrived? This is one question. And the second question is, in the differential analysis 6 slide, uh, from the top, the second step, so del rho by del t plus grad rho dot v bar plus rho grad dot v bar is equal to 0 in that how the third term has arrived? Yeah, so there are two questions. One is related to the slide that is projected right now on the screen, which talks about the volumetric strain rate for the fluid particle. So the volumetric strain rate in its basic sense has been defined as the change in the volume of the fluid particle divided by its original volume and the whole thing then divided by the time interval over which this is happening. So, what has been done is first of all you should uh, note that we are following a particular fluid particle as it goes from one location to the next and while doing it, it is experiencing the uh, volumetric rate of change. So, since we are following a one particular fluid particle, we will necessarily be talking about the substantial rate of change. Now, if you see the expression at the top what we have is 1 over delta t times delta of the volume element divided by delta v, which has been rewritten in the sense that what I have done is, I have taken this 1 over delta t inside and the delta v on the denominator outside. So, you can read the entire left hand side as 1 over delta v change in the volume element over the time interval which is over which it is happening. And as delta t which is a time interval tending to 0, change in the volume element over that delta t is essentially going to be a rate of change of uh, delta v with respect to time. And that is how this substantial derivative has showed up here and the delta v has gone out. So, this delta v here has gone out delta t has come in, as delta t tends to 0, change in the volume element divided by the, the delta t, the time interval essentially becomes a time derivative of the, the volume and that is why we have changed, we have written it as substantial derivative because we are following the fluid particle in its own sense. So, we are we are necessarily employing a Lagrangian method right now because we are following a given single fluid particle. So, that is uh, that is the first question. Let me uh, let me load the other. Uh, yeah. So there was uh, there was a question on uh, slide number six of differential analysis, and uh, in particular. Uh, how this step is getting achieved, if, if I understand the question correctly. So, the way it has been done is that, uh, if, I, if I go back one slide, here we have obtained the continuity equation from the integral form by doing these mathematical manipulations. And the form of the continuity equation comes in the form of divergence of rho times v. Now, Keep in mind that uh, divergence of rho times v essentially implies that rho here is not assumed to be a constant, it is a variable. So, therefore, I am in a position to expand this del dot rho v by expanding the del dot whatever is inside. And if you want to look at the specific form of the expansion, what you should do is you go back to the, the lectures uh, yesterday. And when I had passed out the slides for um, the mathematical background, 
you will see that I have given an expression for del dot a multiplied by a vector b and the expansion of that. So, using that uh, ex, uh, expansion formula which was provided yesterday in the uh, mathematical background, this del dot rho v has been expanded and that is about it really. If you want, you can actually redo this entirely in Cartesian coordinates. So, if you employ Cartesian coordinates, you will see it far more easily. Right now, what I am trying to do here is to save space. I was using the, the expansions directly in the vector form. Uh, however, you can do this entirely in Cartesian coordinate as well. But having said that, I have given you the relevant expansion formulas yesterday in the mathematical background. So, if you do not mind going back to it, you will realize that there is one formula which says del dot a multiplied by vector b and how to expand that. Using that, this particular expansion has been obtained, that is about it. Sir, uh, slide number 15, yes, sir. Uh, you have written under the action of forces, a fluid particle simultaneously undergoes translation, rotation, deformation and after that you have derived independent equations for each particle undergoing translation, rotation, deformation. What about the net composite effect of all these transformation? So, what will be the net transformation uh, due to translation, rotation and deformation on a fluid particle? So, the question is about uh, what, I, what I said on slide number 15 in kinematics that we said that under the action of forces, a fluid particle simultaneously undergoes all this. And then the question is that we have independently analyzed each of these motions, uh, but the question is what happens as a cumulative action of this. In fact, what I did was when I wrote this, I immediately showed the sketch here in slide number 16, which actually shows the cumulative effect. And then what we did was, we decomposed this cumulative effect into independent actions. One was rotation, one was uh, shear deformation and one was volumetric deformation. So, we, we went in the reverse manner in some sense. What we showed was the cumulative effect was shown on slide number 16. So, when the fluid particle goes from the location number 1 where it is rectangular to the location number 2 when it becomes this uh, rhombus type situation. This is actually the cumulative effect. So, the, the fluid particle will translate, it will change its volume, it will also rotate and undergo shear deformation and finally, over a time of delta t, it will look like this. Having said this, we have gone in the next few slides, for example, slide number 17, 18, etcetera and then try to analyze each of these components separately but the cumulative effect is already shown in slide number 16. What about the net uh, cumulative effect is the diagram that you are showing, but can't we have a composed transform equation of it? Yes, you can. Yeah, yes, 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 yes. The equation or yes, no, uh, you, each one separately, but yes. what about the net equation? You, you can the indeed net have net an equation, equation which, uh, which, can, uh, which can show all these effects in one shot. Uh, where you can put together all these uh, rotation, translation, etcetera together. I have not actually put together that equation in this set of slides. The reason is because I wanted to show these effects separately. In fact, the, 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 the issue is that if you put it together as one equation, most of the times it is not really easy to see what sort of detailed uh, issues are happening uh, as a result of uh, each of these different motions. So, indeed you can show this as one equation by putting it together. In fact, some of the advanced textbooks in fluid mechanics, if you read, you will see that they will, they will show this um, uh, combined equation. However, in our experience what, what happens is that if that combined equation is shown, uh, it is somewhat difficult to follow what has been happening in each of these individual effects and that is what I have tried to show separately rather than putting it together. I, I hope that answers your question. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. So uh, right now it is one o'clock. So what we'll do is we'll we'll stop for lunch right now. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.